It may only be week two of HGC, but the race for the Western Clash is on anyway, as we are all tied up between Tempo Storm and Team 12. And for Tempo Storm, this match mod matters a whole lot. It matters for both of them, but Tempo Storm has another fearsome opponent this weekend, Jay Howe. Yeah, on Sunday, they're gonna be facing off against Team Freedom, and it's really gonna shape the mold for how North America's gonna look at the end of this week. I mean, those are three of the top projected teams. Team 12, can they stake their claim at top and then see kind of how Tempo Storm and Team Freedom unfolds? There's a lot to be said from Friday through Sunday of this week from all levels, and I think that's a, it's a really big part to start off week two. Well, let's see where game three takes place. Both teams won on their respective battleground choices. Tempo Storm has chosen battleground that is consistent with what they chose last week when they lost one game versus Heroes Hearth. They pick Volskaya Foundry. And I have news for you guys because Team 12 banned Volskaya Foundry versus LFM Esports last week. This week wanted to ban Cursed Hollow, did not want to play Tempo on there, but that puts them maybe into the clutches of uh, some interesting stuff as we've been seeing on the Volskaya Foundry, at least for drafts. Apparently Tempo couldn't get enough after 34 minutes <laughs> of, temp of Volskaya last weekend. They're gonna bring us to, to Volskaya again. I think compositionally, I saw some of the tweets come out from the players of Tempo Storm. They talked about their composition, might not have been able to finish the deal, right? They got far enough, but they weren't able to kind of seal the deal. I think we might see a little bit more of a blend, maybe a little bit more aggression on their side, or at least maybe some sieging potential. Yes. Uh, so we'll see how they do. Yeah, they had Chromie, Malthiel, and who was the last one? Also offered just pretty much nothing in the way of siege. They're, it's bad. They, it took like two minutes to Dragon's Eye down a fort at oh, one she, point. She, did, she went uh, the level seven cooldown reduction. Did she? She yeah. Mobius looped instead? Yeah. That, so it took a really long yeah, time to take Yeah, that's why it was just fort. like, all right, normally you can just kind of siege up here and poke yeah. this down, but it's like, it just kind of tickles. You know, so I, it was a, it was a really interesting talent pickup uh, that obviously showed at times in that match. I mean, we almost went to game five, really. The only thing that helped was that Tempo Storm finally got a keep and by force of will kept Hero's Hearth at a capture point for a very long time while catapults went in. Unfortunately, a globe didn't quite take out all the catapults and that was the end, but that game was crazy. Oh, oh, oh. wow. Well, I uh, I don't oh. know how I feel about a first pick Zeratul, because you can be That is such a call out. You gotta feel awesome about it. It's so cool. All right, time. there's only one thing you can do if you're Galrung. Pick Illidan. All right, let's see it. Look, I'm not actually saying you should pick Illidan, but if you're just like, look, you're gonna take my hero first pick, I'm going to show you what else I can do, and uh, I don't know how... Zeratul first pick scares me, Gilly. I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I've never been a big fan of first pick Zeratul. I understand, but you gotta say, after Team 12 wins that last game, looks so good on Battlefield of Eternity, a map where Glaurung and the rest of Team 12 dominated for a long time, and then comes in and says, the microphone? <laughs> What's up? We'll take the Zeratul, thank you. Goku, no stranger to Zeratul, actually played quite a few games last year on that. Tassadar, again, you can see, and even the old stealth changes, you could always see them if you're a pro player, like it might just be a, a split second later. But the pros are never like, oh, we can't see them, right? It was never too much of an eye test for them. With the stealth changes, obviously like, look, everybody can see the stealth's coming. What Tassadar does by revealing makes him targetable, and that's a big difference. And when you have Hanzo and Tassadar, Oracle plus the Sonic Arrow, yeah. you're targetable for days. Oh yeah. That's he why th the first big Zeratul, Gilly, you're not, you're basically another hero at this point. You're not sneaking up on anybody. Out of Brightwing, and then you've, you're just good. <laughs> Maybe not Brightwing, though. Let's hope not. But it could be. It could be. It could be. Team 12 now have two more picks. I'm wondering, if Team 12 get Jaina here. Jaina has been one of those counters. It combos with Zeratul, has the slows to set him up for kills. Used to be Void Prison Ring of Frost. Doesn't seem to be Void Prison anymore. Well, they get Grimane and Malfurion instead. Malf still is another hero for a wombo combo though. Yeah, I mean, you can set up a lot with the roots and see if you can, I mean, that used to kind of be, I remember one of the first tournaments that I casted, which was, you know, back in the amateur days, right, was too hard. I mean, old roster of them. I remember they ran. There's a name. Malfurion, Zeratul, Jaina, and it was just like, Phew. I was just like, man, that is killer. Con. They were shredding people. That was old school, old school. Yeah, it's enough that Tempo are like, eh, 
Do we want to let them have more for this wombo? Medivh would set up even more with that with a Leyline Seal. It also gives Zeratul, so if you're going to be revealed and you're in there as Zeratul, yeah. have, like you have a lot of tools at your disposal to get in and out, especially post 10. But if you always have that safety net of I'm protected and I have an escape route, I think, you know, especially given that Zeratul is Goku's hero, Greymane can be Dansky or Cure. And then if you have the Medivh there, it's still a really good setup. You get the mage style damage, you get burst style damage, and then you got the X Factor of Zeratul. So I'm, I'm okay with that Medivh ban, uh, very much so right now. What about a ban for Team 12? Surprisingly, there has not been uh, a warrior pickup yet. Should we get Uther or Jaina banned here? I would think one of those two. It feels the way things have gone. No, for. Mouthail. Just keep Mouthail off the table. That then for, hmm, Tempo Storm have the Hanzo Tassadar combination that they had game one on Dragon. They can't add Zeratul to that. Team 12's already taken that away. Glaurung Hero, Volskaya Foundry, pretty big battleground. Having uh, Leo for the dual soak, maybe possibility. Dahaka for his global, another possibility. But Dahaka Tassadar does. You're going to be relying a lot on Hanzo to make sure he's getting that damage. And fans Tassadar, though, too. Just learn from your opponents. Just draft Asmodee. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't think we'll see that again. Uh, we know how that game goes. Uh, very long game. But Tempo Storm, like you said, they still need that solo, they still need the tank. Are they willing to commit to a lot? There's the solo. We got ourselves a Ragnaros, which uh, also has the potential to stall out a few games. Yes, he does. In more ways well, than four. one. Hmm. Anubarak, of course, has a lot of ability to combo crowd control with himself. Impale and Burrow Charge. You pair that with a Sulfur Smash. The blow up returns to Tempo Storm. We've got Dragon Zero for that, too. You think there's an outside shot if we do get that? We might see a force wall because of the, the different choke points here on the control points. I mean, it doesn't seem as highly likely. Basically, Archon, as well as giving you damage, you have a second escape. Yes. And so with Tassadar's health nerf, he's super squishy. Mm -hmm. So that second escape is almost too good to pass up. There's a lot of value you get damage-wise out of it. But it's normally around that second escape. It's, it's, it's a really good package deal when you go Archon, but if you're really trying to set up those around you, it's a, it's it's possible. Yeah, and post 20, it is very frustrating for a team to play. I don't know what fan will choose there. He's played both, Garrosh. Well then. Garrosh, Li Ming. Having a Li Ming, Greymane backline feels so Team 12 with Kieran Dansky. Just very, very Team 12. We need to come up with like a, a nickname for those guys. They just kind of peanut butter and jelly style. Kierski. There it is. <laughs> Did it. <laughs> that was a lot of work. <laughs> All right, support wise, you've got blow up damage. You've got some sustained damage. I don't know how I'd feel about an Uther here. We haven't seen any Lucio, a hint of Lucio. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about that. It. It was always, last weekend, a lot more prevalent in North America than in Europe or Korea. Korea playing it a little bit, Europe playing it maybe a little bit less, but it seemed to be most played in North America. And even though he he had a pretty good win rate, it was a lot more about his pairing there is in ETC. Oh! Well, well, well. Ariel, welcome back to the meta. I have not seen Hanzo with Ariel. Yeah, an Ari Hanzo Ariel battery. We'll cover the, the Lucio part later. There's some cool stuff going on there. There is some cool stuff. There's some really cool to stuff. To be continued. Yeah, but the Ariel pickup is a bit surprising to me. It is. Of all the things, whether it was Alex Straza, whether it's Stukov, whether it's Lucio, I don't see how Ariel jumps that line. And again, I haven't seen the Hanzo Ariel pairing yet. Well, the knockback is going to be helpful if Justin gets into a good position where he's looking like he's going to get a wrecking ball on someone. Having the knockback for that. Uh, hope more so you can build, especially uh, Energized Cord at 7 yourself, but likely we'll see, uh, I would guess, auto attack then build for Psalms Hanzo. But I haven't seen it either at all, Hanzo and Ario pairing. 
I'm just trying to think of counterplays that could potentially be made. I mean, you can kind of take Garrosh away. Garrosh, you know, with the changes to his QE combo, it's more about him just walking in. Mm -hmm. And if you can use the detainment strike to push him away, maybe you get the effectiveness there to, to keep him at bay. Uh, you also have the infinite sustain. You don't have a mana bar. You're solely relying on energy and your teammates and your own damage. So it does give you the possibility on the control points, which do have long skirmish periods to have that infinite sustain. Let's see how it works out. She's got a Tassadar 2 for help. She's got some blinds, which will also come in handy for some of the heroes at Tempo Storm's disposal. Let's get into the game. Team 12 and Tempo Storm, the Battle of the Tees continue as we head to Volskaya Foundry. These names will be the end of me, Jay Hal. <laughs> I'm like Team Po Storm Team I Twelve. Think, I think I was on that train a couple times earlier, so you're not alone. Got a first class ticket today. Either way, Tempo Storm, a, a, an unlikely draft. I think. I don't. I don't think the Tassadar and the Ariel and the Ragnaros were something I expected to see. Maybe one, but not all three. Yeah, the Ariel has Crystal Aegis, but Aegis has been almost more of a problem than a solution for a lot of teams recently. The heavy mobility, the way that it pre it projects where someone is going to be when the Aegis ends, is going to be pretty nice for Team 12. Having Justine, who can get into position, just throw them over, have the taunt when it's concluded, have Zeratul know where to go in for kills, and then Malfurion to drop roots down. Uh, something that I'm digging here, Gilly, is the, the body check talent for yeah. the Garage. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a change, especially with all the... You have less toss opportunities, and Anubarak has a, an unstoppable burrow out. So it gives you the engage potential. It gives you that setup to allow Dainsky. We've seen good coordination there. Allow Dainsky to follow up. Get that slow there. Allow Dainsky to hit the, the shots. And then, you know, you can get a little bit of damage in yourself. So you get the slow, get the damage, and then help set up your team. Yeah, you don't get the extra range with unrivaled strength. But since that talent was nerfed, it seems like more and more you're starting to see this body check. I'm curious to see how much more into body check we get. Is it a brute force to have the point and click heal reduction? Could be problematic for an Ariel, but again, there's a task there to help with that. And the possibility for Call is Light, Call is Embrace, likely Call is Light like we saw before, trying to help along with that since there is so much uh, blow up potential from Team 12. Both sky slow wind up period in terms of what we generally see style wise. There's only a handful of camps and you know the turret's only gonna do so much, so the value on the turret not normally highly prioritized for invading. And then of course the top camps are a little bit longer distance. You end up deep in enemy territory. So I think teams are content with just kind of trading off early until that first control point period three minutes in. Not an auto attack build for Psalm with Redemption, as we were expecting maybe, but that is an early molt core from Glauron. Uh, but simple geometry and getting the extra scatter arrows when that's complete. There's a lot of control points, those uh, closer in areas for control points. Have that with the piercing arrows at 16, full on, you get the cooldown reduction at seven, as well as the mana cost reduction. You're looking at a lot of area of effect damage, so I thought it'd be auto attack build, but now thinking about it, this makes way more sense to see with Ario because it's sort of like the old multi-shot build where you're focusing on that from Vala as the battery. Bounce around, see what you can get out of it. About 30 seconds away from our first objective phase, which will definitely open this map up just a little bit, kind of change the pacing a little bit. So far, it looks like Team 12 has kind of had the upper hand in terms of getting those rotations, getting some of that early structure damage. But experience-wise, Almost even, Team 12, minor lead. 15 seconds until that control points activated. Tempo Storm saving their assault camp so that can push along with that. Tempo Storm has uh, been looking to make sure that they can have those camps pushing at the right time. Team 12 doing the same though. We saw that in Battlefield of Eternity. But here it's gonna work out better for Tempo Storm. Both teams have a turret for this fight though. They do. I, I really was interested. I want to see how Justine approaches this with Garrosh. You know, we saw Garrosh last week for simplicity. It had a little bit of a tough time uh, in, into that comp, and we get the toss, the blow off the root. That's a, a really good combination. Uh, that's one good thing that Anubarak does. He does have the burrow charge out, but uh, EQ into some roots is uh, looking pretty good to start right there. Yeah, that is one of the combos that Team 12 used with their Garrosh in part two of phase two last year. One reason why they only lost one game in all of part two is because they were so good with this garage 
composition and so oppressing to a team to deal with. Well, Sam looked to be the target, but has natural agility to hop on out of the, over the corner. Tempo Storm maintaining control as the control point continues to climb. I love the fact that uh, Cattle with the Anubarak wow. built in spell armor. Yeah, wow, on. Ooh, that shield keeping him alive there. Uh, is willing to eat shots to keep that turret alive, but Root's uh, a tiny bit late there. Cure gonna dive onto him. Gilly, we've got a Molten Core again. Yeah, Molten Core using to siege and do some damage to uh, Team 12, just enough to force them back off of the control point. 63% continuing to climb. Tempo Storm had to take this back, so that's not gonna last long enough for Tempo Storm to claim the True Glove Protector, but at the very least, it does let them regain control of it and make Team 12 decide, do we want to get on here? Do we want to hit it into overtime? Potentially start to uh, lose out on houses, out on players. They're going to go in, back in again. Goku getting on cattle just in time for the overtime. Spell armor is just way too strong. And you know, Gilly, we're going to have to call you the prophet because we do have Brute Force picked up at level 7 to get that healing reduction on that body check. So specking into that, Little new style Garrosh coming in here. And post level 10, you can collapse onto a target, get that healing reduction, and yes. if the heal's not there, you can force out a Crystal Aegis and open up opportunities for your team. Wow. Wrong and Goku, hello there. That cattle, gonna see if he can take out Goku to trade that out. Dimensional shift as Fan comes out of that. Dansky's looking for blood out to take out Fan, but has his own plasma shield, getting him time to escape. 99% to 75 as Team 12 continues to climb. This is a very close control point. It is. The roots are going to land there. There's the healing reduction, but Cattle with that spell armor keeping him alive. Cure going to have to tuck tail and run there as he is eating a lot of damage. Does have his tap. They'll try and re-engage, but that's a trigger off protector. So if Cattle can't use Burrow Charge because he has to try to make sure that he saves it for when he gets thrown out, what does the engagement look like for Tempo Storm? It, it's a riskier engage because of that. You have to kind of decide, can we get something out of this? And with a Tassadar Hanzo style, with a Ragnaros, I think that they don't necessarily have to force engagements. They can just kind of counter what Team 12 is doing. And so far, they've done a pretty good job at it. And post level 10, I think, will open up new opportunities with potentially the Sulfurous Smash, although I think there's an outside shot we might get Lava Wave. Dragon's Arrow could help with that too as a setup, especially if people are grouped up around the control point. Hit a lot of people from that. But heroic abilities come online for both teams pretty much at the same time. The Protector's still going, doing what sieging it can. Wow, stun after the throw. Taunted from that too. Twilight Dream as the Crystal Aegis comes in and Buds. Buds goes down. No Malfurion as Caterpillar now gets the hit up with the Burrow Charge. A second kill on Lee Ming. Ragnaros did go down. The Tempo Storm <laughs> will take out three just before Som dies, though he's thrown into the base of Team 12. How bad does that feel? How bad? You're like, you're like, all right, I've got the kill. Should be fine. And then literally, as his health ran out, <laughs> tosses you over the wall. Oh, feels bad, man. Brings new meaning to I came in like a wrecking ball. <laughs> Not the way that Sam wanted to go there. Detain oh, I was going to say, I didn't know if he had a blink. Detainment Strike would have helped confirm the kill there, but Goku getting out last second. Nicely done, though, by Justing. He knew he was going to go down, but he threw the squishy Psalm over to the Wolves of Team 12, so at least they could get that next kill. Keeps them in the game. Not too much happening with structures. Uh, so far in this game, it is still Furious Smash for Ragnaros. Yeah, I think the, the scary part for me is that Anubarak, we've already seen the spell armor come into effect. Just hold on a second, we might have a team play here. Tassadar and Ragnaros making their way up. Behold! Behold! That's how important that healing game is. But consider this. Level 13, Ragnaros gets that armor when he's stunned. And it's it's the Resilient Flame is really strong. And we already see the spell armor. Now you get armor from that as well with a very short internal cooldown on it. So we saw the collapse directly onto Ragnaros, and they weren't able to get the blow up. They're not going to, it's going to be difficult to get the blow up on Ragnaros. It's going to be difficult to get the blow up on a Nubarek. In those moments, the minute they all end on one hero, they weren't able to confirm it right away and then ended up having a losing one for three trade. And so that scares me a little bit for Team 12 going forward if that's how their engagements look. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's just for stuns, right? 
I, doesn't count for silences? Because Warlord's Challenge is a, is a silence. Twilight Dreams is silence. They got roots. There's not. It's it's just the it's just the combo of Garrosh. Well, it doesn't matter because. Uh, yeah, I wondered if he was going to do something else because of that. Yeah, Temper flame. flame. That is a very good point. I want to say we've got roots, we've got silence, but yeah. technically no stun. Song? Oh man, there's a stun. Root underneath, Crystal uses force, but uh, it's going to be hard to keep him alive, especially with that Twilight Dream goes down. Good night, Tempo Storm. Three kills. Ario lasting just a little bit longer than I thought. But that Twilight Dream was money from Buds. Well, like I said, their engagements are going to be just fine, Gilly. Yep. Uh, either way, they got caught out there. They yeah. got punished, and uh, Team 12 uh, definitely capitalized on that. And sometimes those small mistakes are uh, going to have a big impact on the game. And right now, they're just going to walk right in, opens this up. And furthermore, not only does it give them the slight lead experience-wise, open up avenues for future win conditions and things like that, but they also have an opening to the point they have a healing well. Tempo Storm does not. So if it becomes a long skirmish here over this control point, that is definitely in favor of Team 12 because they do not have a retreat point. Yeah, as it's likely to do. The last control point lasted a long time. Both teams on even talent tiers as the control point starts. Tempo Storm sent out the Dragon's Arrow. Didn't catch Goku so Glauron could get that kill. But the rotation up from Tempo Storm, faster to get all five of the team here to the point. Justin's going to back off for a little bit. Yeah, Goku ended up being handcuffed a little bit to that bottom lane, and that allowed for Tempo Storm to rotate up a bit quicker. So credit goes to Tempo, although Goku's got himself a fan on the backside. Dimensional shift used. Still has Archon available. Throwing stun. Taunt after that, too. Detainment strike for Justin, but a new Rex still has to go into Crystal Aegis. Burrow charges out this time out of the Twilight Dream. That's a lot for Team 12 being used, but Team 12 are closer to 16. That is one thing still going for them. Tempo Storm have Sulfurous Smash, they have the Cocoon, and they have Archon if they want to stay in this fight. And the good thing is, is that they have some shorter cooldowns. You know, the Taunt is short, Disintegrate short. The roots are going to be there, so they can they have multiple attempts. They just don't have the Twilight Dream. They do have Cursed Bullet, which was just used again. So they do have short enough cooldowns to where they can continue to kind of hit the hit the reset button and try and get the blowups again. Team 12, their percentage climbing, the rotation up, being able to get the initial setup for the control point, working out really well for them because it puts Tempo Storm on a timer if they want to try to contest this. And without 16s, even though they do have some really big heroic abilities still available, they're just not feeling confident in dealing with Team 12 and having 16. They want to make sure that they can get 16, and they want to make sure that they have some tools for the defense of uh, this protector. Cattle took some harassment there. They get the turret, they have the assault camp in the top. It gives them some time trying to get to 16 of their own. Yeah, and with Molten Core, it always makes it difficult to kind of siege up on stuff. Uh, you can just kind of see Glauron actually looking for a flank here. Tassadar, you can see on the minimap, starting to make his way up. And Glauron, that is. Is he going to flank Molten? I think he's going to try to flank Molten. Yeah, but keep with no wave of force. Yeah, he's yeah. she, she is, he's going to go. He's got the cure. Cure Sulfurous Smash fans there too. He did it. He had the flank. He takes out Greymane. Oh man, Clown just making these plays. That's a that's a got a moment, but Psalm, Psalm on the backside disintegrate, not able to get the takedown on Hanzo. Cocoon is gonna be there, but with Psalm losing most of his health there, not able to follow up, but a very heads up play here by Tempo and Glauron getting that in. I was terrified. I was speechless. I was so scared. There's no way he would get this off, right? But everyone was so focused on the front, Tempo played that to a T. It's not just Glaurung. You have to give credit to Tempo Storm, keeping Team 12 distracted just long enough so we could get in that. Impressive from Tempo. And they don't lose their keep. They don't really take damage in that lane because of that. Well done. Ended up uh, losing that turret there. Cattle got the stun. He's like, I'm taking this, and I'm dipping right on out. A uh, nice little invade, uh, nothing overly effective, but uh, it shows that tempo that we knew last year, Gilly, of uh, just kind of stalling mid-game, uh, later in the game, to where we would say, all right, you know, tempo, you've done great, but we need you to continue doing these things. It seems like 
a lot of what they're doing is a huge change in mentality from what we saw last year. Yeah, even uh, last week had a lot more aggression, um, making sure to invade camps. Never felt like Heroes Hearth could catch their breath in the series versus Temp uh, Tempo Storm. Things like um, the camp invades, the rotations, along with Psalm, so that he could not only get the Kel'Thuzad stacks, but start to get some picks, set them up so that they often had a level and a half lead by the time they got to 10 versus Heroes Hearth. But it's great to see that Team 12 has not been letting that happen to them the way that Tempo Storm were able to get versus Heroes Hearth. Temp Team 12, even though they were a little more defensive versus LFM, have really brought the fight to Tempo Storm in the series. I, I think this is when two tough teams face each other. The same thing that you said in the competitive scene, when you can get that level and a half lead just through like one camp invade, and then you just become that smother that smothering style of just continuing to keep the pressure up. That's what you see all the top teams do. They'll never let you catch up. It's If we look back, just the, the play that Fan made on that concussion mine on Infernal Shrines last week, they got the kill on Tychus, they got a, a lead out of that, and then they never let up. And it's moments like that that why you see Tempo Storm being regarded as one of the top teams here in North America because they have the experience and the talent to make those moments happen. Yeah, and another mark of those amazing teams is knowing when you need to make big plays or not even big plays, but the moment you're starting to get behind, knowing that you need to do something so that it doesn't get snowballed against you, stopping the snowball early. And that's what Tempo Storm did in the last uh, did in the last fight with the Glowering playing. The Glowering is in trouble. Goku harassing him, slows him down with the Singularity Spike. Dansky trying to keep up the chase. There's a number on him with the Mirror Ball. Justin, though, the cocoon right as he gets done. That disintegrate's gonna pop that. There's the taunt instantly. It forces out the Crystal Legion. Glowrung, however, is gonna go down. Dainsky's gonna try and get the capitalization as the resets are gonna be there as the Twilight Dream goes. That's three members down. Team 12 explosively starting that team fight. Yeah, that was Reset City for Dainsky. Part of the problem was that two members were in trouble and there was only one Crystal Aegis that gets forced on the Anubarak. Go, uh, Glau is still caught inside of the taunt, so they can turn around and blow him up very quickly. He wasn't even able to try to get a Sulfur Smash on someone to combo off and get a kill there. Dainsky felt very confident, just going in for the resets. And Kier and especially the Twilight Dream just setting that up. But now Team 12, they might not have been able to get the keep before, but they get it now. Setting that up is beautifully for this end game. That is something that is such a big moment here. We have a two level lead, 20 tier advantage. And this is something that I want to see how will the teams approach Sky, uh, both Sky. The keep is down top lane, but you have Molten Core. This is something that Tempo themselves dealt with last week. Do you get the Protector and try and end the game, or do you try and take another keep? Fortunately for Team 12, they have that two-level lead. They have a little bit of time to decide, but what they do with this Protector will be very telling for the competitive scene here. It's also so nice for Team 12 that they don't have to face Tempo Storm on this control point because it's tricky with how the conveyor belts are set up as you can see it's not something that they want to be fighting on because the conveyor belts just add this element of pure mayhem to a team fight temple storm doing everything they can just to get their 20 catch up make sure that they have the right defense this is uh, a mark of a great team in team 12 tempo storm they know have to get structure damage for their best opportunity to get back in the game. Team 12 with their CG potential instantly takes down a fort, instantly takes down keep wall. And Gilly, the question that we were asking on what they would do with the protector, well, answered. this makes it a lot easier to answer that question. And that bot, that bot keep, uh, probably going to be going down after this. Molten core still a thing though to consider. And because Team 12 ensured that they had one person on the control point the whole time they were pushing that, Seratol. Temple Storm are gonna have to fight without 20. That's how they feel anyway. The Dragon's Arrow comes in. Sulfurous Smash takes down Li Ming. And with the Molten Core damage and the slows from Fan, they're hoping that they can get a second on Justing. He uses Double Up, has a lot of armor now to get him back to the safety of his base. Triglav Protector is grabbed by Zeratul, but they'll have to do this without Li Ming. Oh baby, Tempo Storm. Boy, they know the calls to make. By the time the Leeming is back, there's about 30 seconds left. Back towards the fight, I should say. But this protector's not going to make it that long. No, it's taking heavy damage. Go back in for a charge, but half of its health bar gone. 
as it was just trying to siege the final four in the mid. Oh, there's a camp in the top. That's going to send in Glaron. I'm amazed by Tempo Storm. They were willing to risk Molten Core there. They don't have heroic difficulty yet. They risked Molten Core to get the kill because they knew that that was the play they needed to make. They did not save that just in case we're going to need this for defense. They committed to that, and that let them get that Lee Ming kill. Now they have 20, and they didn't lose a second keep. It really felt like Team 12 might have overplayed their hand a little bit. Like, they got most of the keep wall, stayed a little bit too long. Great setup by Tempo. Most of the time, you feel pretty comfortable there because you're like, look, we've got 20. Surely they're not going to fight us. Uh, but this is a different Tempo Storm, making the, the right calls at the right time. And that neutralized the entire game. Bottom keep now stays alive. 20 is picked up by Tempo Storm. That's just a great play by Tempo. Really big playmaking level 20 tier for both sides. And I'm looking at Diamond Resolve, not the standard for Ariel. We'll have to wait on that because Cocoon's going to go down. Lee Ming gets stopped before she can break it out. She has to go back. Dragon's Arrow has already come out. The Twilight Dream down. Glaurung is in a heap of trouble. Gets hit by that Crystal Aegis, and it gives him a shield to the armor so that he can get caught back up. He is nice and healthy as he brings down Garrosh. Cure trying to find some way to splash the damage to get the kill. Oh, We've got another Molten Core. Buds, Buds he's going to go. Nice oh, ice block man. there to keep him alive. Such a good ice block. That was money. That was everything for Buds to stay alive. The sieging is still going. Oh. And the control of this, Tassadar's down. Oh my, in the blink of an eye, Tassadar just gets annihilated. Dainsky and team, they're looking to continue to go forward. Goku does get dismounted there. I mean, that happened so fast. I was just like, where did he go? You think that you're safe underneath that Molten Core. Team 12 just proved otherwise. That is insane. I, that is two heavyweights throwing down. You throw, I'm throwing back, and <laughs> that's nasty. That was Goku, right? I Went in, assassinated. So. Hopefully we can see that again. It was so freaking fast. I was so worried about Buds, but uh, apparently so were Tempo Storm enough that they lost their Tassadar. Dragon Zero hits a bunch. Play of the game. Not chasing that out, but it's a 60 second cooldown until you have that back now. Every Hanzo mains dream, getting play of the game. Play of the game. We've got ourselves a battle here. 10 kills to seven, 22 to 21. We're 20 minutes in. Here's there we that go. replay. It's actually uh, quite a bit earlier in that. And it, would, it would be a, quite a bit far forward, but this team fight alone, Justin just being stopped there, double up, just not enough to keep him alive. Yeah, we can talk about that diamond resolve too, because when you pop out of Crystal Aegis, you get the 50 armor, and then had the armor uh, as well from, I believe, the Tassadar shielding. So he just was so survivable there. And this is a big turn. Right. All right, watch fan. It's got to be Goku. That's a reveal. Goku cure together. Yeah, they, man, just. I mean, he's just gone. He was there and, and gone. There and back again. A Goku tail. A Tassadar tail. <laughs> As he is back, everyone's back. 21 minutes into our Volskaya Foundry game. Still a ways to go until we get the longest Volskaya game for HGC. I don't think that's happening. I mean, by taking down that mid fort that we had earlier by Tempo Storm, it opens up a potential win condition for them. Obviously, we know the win condition is going to be basically a team fight at this point for Tempo Storm. They can get this, and same on, on the side of Team 12. The objective doesn't necessarily end the game. It's late enough to where it feels like it should for Tempo, but it's not going to come without getting a team fight. So it's up to both teams here. That's why. That's what's going to make this such a tense moment, as they actually give up control. Team 12 gives up control temporarily of the control point. Yeah, Glaurung forced the minion wave all the way back in. Did draw up Goku for a bit, but he had the protection of the double support. Tempo Storm doing everything they can to keep eyes on Team 12. Zeratul with the Scatter Arrow, the Sonic Arrow, and of course, the Oracle of Tassadar. Tassadar has to head up, try to Psionic Storm some of the minions there. And Team 12 feels that they get a little more aggressive. 
They get a little more aggressive. Justine. Justine taking a lot of damage. There's a little bit of a stun. The follow-up, the Sulfura Smash is going to come down. Justine staying alive, does get the heal. Stop. That was interrupted. The Twilight Dream was interrupted, but Glaurung and team are staying on it, Gilly. Yeah, the Twilight Dream was interrupted. He still doesn't have it yet. Three seconds, and Tempo Storm trying to collapse in there. Team 12 hoping they can get in and save him in time, and it looks like they almost did, but Malfurion falls just at the end, just when he would have been maybe able to help turn that fight around. Had he gotten a Twilight Dream off and the rest of the team been able to come around, that surely would have been devastating for Tempo Storm, especially since he has Astral Communion, could have gotten right into Tempo Storm. So it was so crucial that they got that kill there, and they did. Team 12, they're not relenting just yet. You can actually see Zeratul has come down to the control point temporarily. This buys time for Team 12 to come back because they'll need their support if they're going to mount a a sufficient defense. And again, the Trigloth Protector doesn't necessarily make this checkmate, Gilly, because there's still so much standing in the way for Tempo Storm. Had that fight gone another way, we're looking at a different fight. And not using Twilight Dream that last fight. He has Twilight Dream up. But Sulfur Smash will be back. It's Archon that was used. Triglav Protector starting to push on in that mid lane. The only place where there might be an opening for Tempo to win this game. Use Molten Core early on. Starting to siege down, using that first so it can do some damage. And it can do some major damage, as with the Dragon's Arrow and a Sulfurous Smash, Zeratul falls. Goku getting hyper aggressive, getting punished. Now, losing a keep here is not the end of the game. Losing another life if you're on the side of Team 12, however, is. Dainsky is doing well to land his skill shots, play at a safe distance, and get the Protector down. Just getting a keep here is a win for Tempo Storm in terms of what they're getting out of this. But Team 12, they're very much, it's one keep to one. Molten Core is down. Tempo is somewhat looking for an opening. I don't think they're going to find it, Gilly. They throw out the Rocket Fist, but nobody it didn't connect with anybody, and that Protector is far too low. And a lot of heroic abilities were used in that fight. So they still didn't have uh, the Dragon's Arrow since it was used, and the Sulfurous Smash were used to get that Zeratul kill. What that did do is open up a win condition now for Tempo Storm. They need to go top. They need to clear that out. But if Tempo Storm can win another fight decisively, get the right amount of picks, this will be Tempo Storm's game. Yeah, with Archon there, we've seen, I mean, you and I casted a heck of a game last year where you just siege up with Archon and you can just kind of stay on that core, but it's going to require a kill or two here. Dead even, pretty much across the board as we approach 25, 26 minutes in. They dropped that. Hmm. They clear on top, push that out. Gives them time to do that. There's really just not too much. You have the assault camp in the top as a camp to push, but otherwise there's not, it's not like you're heading around and just getting a ton of, uh, of mercenary camps to push various lanes. That is the only pushing camp on this map. And the thing is, is that with the next control point, it will be top. So them holding this, I mean, you can hold it for when it comes time to contest the control point. It gives you a little bit of control around there, but it's it's all for naught on this map because the next control point should decide the game in terms of a team fight unless we just have like an absolute bloodbath where multiple members go down on both sides somebody might decisively just take the team fight and this game's going to be over we're going to find out right now tempo has the double heal pulse that's a pretty big advantage for a team goku's going to go straight in for some harassment wormhole out Still having this fort in the top lane is really nice. There's no well there, but there's still the fort as a retreat option for Team <laughs> He blinked as the cocoon was going to land on him and gave him just enough distance. But like, there's not going to be any follow up here. I'm fine. It's fine. I'm just going to blink over here. I think that happened in either a GCWC or a BlizzCon game with the Genji and a Swift Strike. It was like just enough of a Swift Strike out. <laughs> Well, 24 to 24. Tempo familiar with these long games here on Volskaya. Mm -hmm. They have run the gauntlet, haven't they? They're just trying to make sure that at the end of the season, they have really high average hero damage per game via Volskaya. 
coming into this week, they were pretty much at the tops for those reasons. The 35-minute Volskaya game will definitely do that for you. Oh, yes. I like the tempo are still trying to do what they can to take down this fort, though. So there's not as much of a bastion of safety for Team 12, especially if tempo gets the urge for a chase. Also, taking that down makes uh, another flanking Molten Core more of an option for Ragnaros. Definitely. Uh, I'm still waiting for the next the next phase here. It's got to be coming any moment, right? Soon. T yeah, there it is, now. 30 seconds. I was going to say, I, I'm looking at the clock, and I'm like, all right, it should be right about, OK, there it is. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's 2.50 after the last protector goes down. 2.50. You're right. I, I mispronounced that. That's on me. Actually, uh, G no. Uh, either <laughs> way, we got ourselves a fight here, top lane. It, this has got to be it. Oh, yeah, 100%. It seems Team 12, that synergy that they had with the toss, the stun, the root, they haven't been able to get it. It's going to proc the Nerubian armor, keep that off cooldown. There's the toss. Toss time. Ooh, right. just in time. Right before Ragnarok. the root. Now that's a Molten Core usage. This gives the swap over on the control point to Tempo Storm. Did he get in and then instantly cancel? Because he's already out. It seemed a bit early. Huh. I think he might have seen an opening. They weren't able to get it. Now they've got the combo. There's the taunt. The Crystal Leech is going to land in time. See if they can get the follow-up, Gilly. Bods gets in for the Twilight Dream. The turnaround is immense as they bring down Malfurion. As soon as he gets in, Twilight Dreaming going in with the Astral Communion. Now Garrosh goes down to a Meteor, and things are falling apart for Team 12. Just like that, Tempo seemingly has taken the game in their hands. Dainsky is going to run, but it's not any place you can hide as. Or is it? Is it? I mean, for a moment. Either way, that's three members down. It looks like we've got a battle going on here, unless we have just some absolutely heroic play by Greymane and Zeratul. This game should be over. They're going to make sure and pick up another healing pulse just in case. Yeah, they used both of them in that fight, too. Such a, such a good job from Tempo Storm. They had the Crystal Aegis. Buds really wanted to hit the Twilight Dream after that. We saw a lot of people from Tempo Storm. Now they've got the Molten Core, but the swing around, the Sulfurous Smash to take down Buds brought him down so, so fast with the stun lock. Saw him take some damage. They've got Crystal Aegis to keep him alive again. But with the Molten Core, you've still got the Archon going. Tempo Storm are getting fairly low in health. But they'll take down Zeratul, and that just ensures that they can get onto the score. Yeah, they tried. They were unable to. The follow-up damage, that's going to be Greymane going down, as well as the core here, as only Garrosh and Malfurion are there. It's just way too late in the game to come back. Tempo Storm comes back in this game to take game number three, Gilly. And that was some impressive late-game team fighting for them. Tempo Storm had their fill of late game Bull Sky Foundry and feel like they learned enough from it. They'll go ahead and take this on right on back there. They get the win and that puts them up two games over Team 12 in this best of five. One more will secure the victory. And this is such an important game. This is such an important series. Tempo Storm has to play Freedom on Sunday. Tempo Storm and Team 12 both eyeing the number one spot in the region hungrily. They want that number one spot. It's better seating for the Western Clash. It's bragging rights, especially for Glaurung. A little bit. I mean, as much as he would just want to say, look, I want to see who's the strongest. You know, you know there's some pride involved. By oh, the way, yeah. I looked at the 30 minutes, 44 seconds. That's a combined two games for Tempo Storm. Uh, Over an hour. Yeah, uh, 65 plus minutes now. Not too, not too bad, uh, Tempo <laughs> Storm. Volskaya, we'll see what happens with that down the road. But uh, as it stands, Tempo gets a, another victory on that map, sitting at 2-0 and there, obviously, as uh, they've taken the lead here 2-1 against Team 12. We know Tempo Storm does need a new favorite map, not having Warhead Junction in the map pool anymore. Maybe it's Volskaya well, from Foundry. From the quickest to the longest? Yeah. That's one way to do it. But Team 12, I mean, they looked really good. Yeah. I mean, they, we saw what they wanted to do. They were able to pull it off, but it really seemed like Ariel going into that. We saw the heals, the healing pulse obviously came out. And then, as you alluded to, with the upgrade to Crystal Aegis, really helped because even when they would come out of the Crystal Aegis in the beginning, post-level 10, they were still finding ways to get blow-ups. Yes. The minute level 20 hit, they were not able to follow up on that and confirm the kills. 
And then the turnaround from Tempo Storm is kind of what changed the dynamic. Post level 20 seemed like an entirely different game for Tempo. Yeah, there, there was no way to kill anybody who got caught from uh, the combo of Garrosh. And even when the Garrosh combos were landing, Anubarak just seemed to be such a good pick for Tempo Storm because it was mostly on that Anubarak. And you could see the the tenseness of the situation that Buds felt he needed to go in, Astral Communion in. It was a, a scary spot. I don't even think he had time to make it into Ice Block because once Anubarak gets to 20 and gets rewind, you're going to be stunned for <laughs> so long. The lockdown from that, from Sulfurous Smash 2, you've got stuns from uh, the Ariel if it's in the right position. It's just a really difficult situation for whoever was going to be in there for the stun lock. So both sides trying to get that and make that work, but it worked a bit better for Tempo Storm. Yeah, it's just when you see Malfurion go in and you don't get the kill and you yeah. just see him try and scurry away, it's just like you're, you're not getting away from this. So, uh, again, a, a valiant effort on Team 12's side. This series, I feel, uh, this could be a potential five-gamer. I mean, oh, yeah. th these guys are just going back and forth. Team 12 could have easily won that game. I mean, the the flanking Glaurung on the Molten Core to get the pick when they should have lost, and then they do get the keep top. And then Team 12 staying two seconds too long in the bot lane, and then again they get the follow-up. I feel that's going to be a moment that Team 12 looks back on, and they're like, man, we got the keep wall. But did we really need to stay that long? They could have got the protector, got double all up on keeps, and basically had a really strong hold on that game. But the minute that happened, it allowed Tempo to kind of get 20, get back in the game. That was a huge turning point. And they, it seemed like all the momentum was in Tempo's favor after that. And I, I feel like that was a big mistake on the side of Team 12. Well, let's let's go to the map pool because we want to get into the next draft. But there were so many plays from Tempo Storm that 